Hi, I'm TJ Arand, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at George Gwinnett College. You're about to watch a documentary celebrating the 400th anniversary of the crossing of the Mayflower. As you do, I invite you to consider the other Mayflower, its namesake. This is a small, trailing, evergreen shrub that doesn't bear fruit. And because it doesn't bear fruit, seeds are hard to come by. But it does have the ability to take cuttings, and a skilled gardener can take those cuttings and attempt to make it take root. This is really hard work. It doesn't usually uh, happen. But when it does happen, when the cutting takes root, the plant thrives. I invite you to think on the humble Mayflower as you consider the struggles and the ultimate success of the pilgrims. Enjoy the show. Who would true valor see? Let him come hither. One here will constant be, come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement, shall make him once relent. His first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Four centuries ago, the pilgrims came to America on board a ship called Mayflower. This video tells their story, a story that has captured the imagination of Americans throughout their history. On August 15, 1620, two vessels, Mayflower and Speedwell, sailed out of Southampton, England, carrying settlers, a group called the Pilgrims, bound for the New World. However, the Speedwell, which was one-third the size of Mayflower, developed leaks and therefore did not speed very well. The two-ship convoy returned twice to England in what proved to be a futile effort to repair the smaller ship. On September 6th, Mayflower, alone, departed Plymouth. Mayflower was a cargo ship. It had not been designed as an ocean-going vessel, and it certainly was not a luxury cruise ship. Pretend that this blue cloth represents the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Here is the ocean liner Titanic on its maiden voyage in April 1912, 882 feet long, weighing about 50,000 tons. And here is Mayflower, about 100 feet long, weighing 180 tons. Titanic, therefore, was nine times longer and 250 times heavier than the Mayflower. On which one would you rather be sailing? Well, actually, only one of these ships made it safely across the ocean, and it was not the Titanic, which hit an iceberg and sank, while the little Mayflower, with its precious cargo of settlers for the New World, completed the journey. No one knows exactly what happened to the original Mayflower, though strong evidence suggests that she was broken up around 1624. In 1957, a replica Mayflower II was constructed in England and sailed across the Atlantic. Here are some close-up photos of this plastic model of Mayflower II. It took about 280 man-hours to paint it and assemble it. The original Mayflower carried 54 pilgrims, along with another 48 passengers. Of these 102 people, there were 50 men, 20 women, 22 boys, and 10 girls. Including the crew, there were about 130 souls on board when she left port. While en route, two men died and were buried at sea, and one young man, John Howland, fell overboard and was amazingly rescued by holding onto a rope and being hauled back onto the deck. Meanwhile, a baby boy, appropriately named Oceanus, was born during the voyage, and another boy, Peregrine, was born while the ship lay at anchor off of Cape Cod. By the way, can you imagine being heavily pregnant and going on a trip like this? The fact that these women were willing to go on this journey says something of their bravery, courage, determination, faith, and commitment. The transatlantic journey was extraordinarily difficult. It covered 3,500 miles and an average speed of around 50 miles per day, or about two miles per hour. Battered by fierce storms, one of the main beams amidships bowed and cracked, and leaks abounded. 
towering waves threatened. But on November 9th, after 64 days at sea, land was sighted. Here's a map of the current Commonwealth of Massachusetts. On November 11th, 1620, Mayflower anchored at a place now called Provincetown at the very end of Cape Cod. This is where the Mayflower Compact was written and signed. The Pilgrims, for several weeks, explored this area of Cape Cod and eventually sailed across Massachusetts Bay to the place that they would call Plymouth, landing at Plymouth Rock December 18, 1620. The purple dot here represents Boston, Massachusetts capital. As the Pilgrims landed in the place where they established Plymouth Colony, they stepped onto a boulder which became known as Plymouth Rock. This granite stone was originally much bigger than it is today, as pieces of it were split off over time. The piece of Plymouth Rock that is displayed outdoors in Plymouth, Massachusetts, is about the size of a dining room table. The year of the landing, 1620, was chiseled into the rock in 1880. Courtesy, the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Here is sand from the beach at Plymouth. As you consider its color and texture, Remember that that's what the pilgrims saw and felt, and that's on what they trod as they came ashore 400 years ago. Well, the adventure of the Mayflower is interesting in its own right. However, it is important to know why these pilgrims came to the New World. In order really to understand why they made this trip, we must first know who they were and what they believed. In terms of their doctrine, the pilgrims were Christians. They believe that the Bible is the Word of God, they believed in the Trinity, and they believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man. They were Protestants. With Martin Luther, they believed in justification by faith alone, that is, being pronounced not guilty in God's courtroom based on the sacrifice of Christ at the cross. They were Calvinists. Like John Calvin, they believed in the sovereignty of God, and in God having predestined his chosen people, the elect, to salvation. And they were covenantalists. They believed that a covenant is a solemn agreement between two or more parties, that God relates to mankind through covenants, and that men and women can thus relate to each other covenantally. With respect to pilgrim worship, pilgrim worship services were simple. There was nothing elaborate about the worship they offered. It consisted of Bible reading, prayer, singing, preaching, and the sacraments of baptism and communion. Unlike the Anglican Church, there was no liturgy. Pilgrim worship services were word-based. They were not emotionalistic, nor were they a deliberate appeal to the senses. They were long. A sermon often lasted an hour or two, and they were regulated, seeking to follow the Bible strictly in terms of worship. And here's a rendering of a public worship service in Plymouth Colony. Though the King James Version of the Bible was published in 1611, only nine years before the pilgrims sailed, they preferred to continue to use the Geneva Bible, which had been printed in 1599. Here's a modern printing of the Geneva Bible. As you can see from a close-up of a couple of pages, above the line is the scripture, and below the line, in smaller type, are notes on the various verses. Commentary from a Calvinistic perspective to aid the reader in understanding the Bible. Pilgrim worship songs were the 150 biblical songs. The pilgrims identified with ancient Israel, and they sang the inspired songs which the people of God had always sung. They sang those songs a cappella, the term a cappella meaning in the manner of the chapel, indicating singing without musical accompaniment. And they sang with meter, that is, a set pattern of syllables per line and rhyme which was easier to sing than Gregorian chants. The Psalter used by the pilgrims was compiled by Henry Ainsworth in 1612. Here is the Ainsworth version of Psalm 100 using the familiar tune, The Old Hundredth. 
Shout to Jehovah all the earth. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Before him come with singing mirth. Know that Jehovah he God is. It's he that made us and not we. His folk and sheep of his feeding. Oh, with confession enter ye. His gates, his courtyards with praising. Confess to him, bless ye his name. Because Jehovah he good is, his mercy ever is the same, and his faith unto all ages. The pilgrims were known by several names, including Brownists. One of the early leaders was Robert Brown, B-R-O-W-N-E. The distinguishing mark of the pilgrims is that they were separatists. Though sharing much in common with the Puritans, and indeed one could consider the pilgrims as part of a broad Puritan movement in the 16th and 17th centuries, the pilgrims differed in one key matter, ecclesiology or the nature of the church. While the Puritans were committed to attempt to purify the Church of England, the pilgrims had concluded that the Anglican Church was hopelessly corrupt and therefore the only faithful response was to separate. This conclusion manifested itself in other ways. For example, the pilgrims rejected the idea of an established church supported by the civil government and instead promoted the concept of a gathered church with totally voluntary rather than compelled participation. They also came to believe in a Congregationalist viewpoint in which each congregation was independent and self-sufficient. This separatist perspective undermined the authority of the king and his view of absolutism, that is, the idea that all authority in his realm revolved around the king, including the church. Accordingly, the pilgrims' separatist views led to intense persecution in England, including fines, imprisonment, torture, and death. Quite a few risked everything to flee to Leiden, the Netherlands, in 1608, where they could practice their faith freely. However, they eventually felt uncomfortable in their adopted country, and they traveled back to England from whence many of them would embark on a voyage to the New World. So, why did they come to America? Every schoolchild knows why Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 for the three G's of God, gold, and glory. For the pilgrims, though there were factors such as promoting the kingdom of England and bringing honor to the settlers, the motivation primarily was religious in nature, that is, for God and his glory. There are three aspects of this religious motivation. The first is the matter of religious liberty. This is the obvious answer and reflects their conscientious commitment. Faced with persecution, in which they either had to give up their beliefs or suffer for them, going to the new world was one way out of their dilemma. Secondly, there was a desire to proclaim the gospel. Akin to one of the goals for the founding of Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, the evangelizing of the natives was a major reason. And thirdly, the pilgrims sought to build Christ's kingdom, similar to those Puritans who immigrated to Massachusetts in 1630 with the purpose of establishing in New England a city set on a hill. The pilgrims also sought to establish a model society that would be a light back to old England as to what a Christian commonwealth should look like. The pilgrims were aware that some might question their leaving England for America. One pilgrim argued the case this way. First, 
Given the pilgrim's daily prayer for the conversion of the natives, it is reasonable to believe that those prayers will be answered through ordinary means rather than only referred to God's extraordinary work from heaven. Also, the land in the colony was common land and largely empty and unused. And furthermore, the emperor, Indian chief Massasoit, allowed them to live in his land. He did so not only because they are the servants of King James, to whom he professed alliance, but also because the chief had found the pilgrims just, honest, kind, and peaceable, and so loves our company. After a hard winter, 1620 to 1621, the pilgrims were struggling for survival when all of a sudden on March 16th, an Algonquian Indian speaking English walked into Plymouth. Can you imagine the pilgrim's surprise? Chief Samoset had learned English from fishing captains. A few days after his visit to Plymouth, he returned with Squanto, another English-speaking Indian, the last of the Patuxet tribe, which had been wiped out in a mysterious plague in 1616. It was the Patuxet's cleared land that the pilgrims occupied. Squanto provided invaluable advice, which enabled the Plymouth colony to survive. He and Samoset arranged for a meeting with Chief Massasoit of the Wampanoags, the pilgrims' nearest neighbors. The resulting friendship led to a peace treaty that lasted half a century, a treaty that provided for mutual defense and a form of extradition. Here's a portrayal of Governor John Carver and Chief Massasoit smoking a peace pipe. As we consider the pilgrim's arrival, we must not overlook the Mayflower Compact. The reason for this compact was because the pilgrims had landed far north of where they should have been. The pilgrims were supposed to settle in Virginia, which then stretched from Jamestown up to the mouth of the Hudson River. Mayflower, after a dreadful journey of nine weeks, fought against contrary winds as it reached Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts, but could not proceed farther south. Here's a globe that portrays how the world would have been seen several centuries ago. You see that in the Atlantic there be dragons out there. And here is a more modern globe from the 1950s. As the Mayflower came across from England to the New World, it was off course many miles from its intended destination. Settling in an area outside of where their charter specified put these emigrants in an extra legal, that is outside of the law, position. Given the possibility of controversy and conflict, there was the need for a formal agreement amongst themselves. Accordingly, one of the leaders drew up what became known as the Mayflower Compact. A pact, or compact, is like a covenant. The importance of this document cannot be overestimated. This is the first written constitution in American history. Arguably, it is as significant as other foundational documents, such as the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, especially because it was the first document that implicitly maintained the notion of the consent of the governed, while still recognizing the rule of King James I. The Mayflower Compact was key in establishing a principle of people being governed by elected leaders rather than by royalty ruling according to divine right of kings. Also, the agreement was in writing. This policy of self-government was put into practice in both civil and church realms. In terms of civil government, the colonists annually elected a governor. For 30 years, by vote of the people, William Bradford served as governor of Plymouth Colony. But also in terms of church government, the people selecting their own elders reinforced the principle that rulers should be elected rather than imposed from the top down, as in the Anglican Church with its bishops under the authority of the king. The Thanksgiving observance by the pilgrims in 1621 was not the first in America. Among English colonists, that honor goes to Jamestown, Virginia. Nevertheless, what happened in Plymouth Colony has become the best known such event, at least in part because of the friendship and sharing between the pilgrims and the Wampanoags on this occasion. 
As with the Puritans, Thanksgiving for the pilgrims was primarily religious in nature. It was a special occasion for giving thanks to God for his many mercies. It was not designed as an annual event. It was to be observed for particular divine blessings. Similarly, fasts, that is, times of abstaining from food, were employed on an occasional basis, whenever divine providence indicated the need for an intense time of prayer and humiliation before God. Besides involving acts of worship, such as prayer, singing psalms, and preaching, Thanksgiving was also a time for playing games and for feasting. Chief Massasoit, having been invited to the meal, brought his own guests, 90 Indians. Can you imagine? He also provided five dressed deer and wild turkey. So turkey was on the menu, but it would not have been Butterball or Purdue, only the wild variety. Other wildfowl, such as duck and goose, most likely were more prominent. Other foods of that feast could have been pigeon, corn, and seafood, including eel, lobster, clams, and mussels. Beer and wine would have freely flowed. Various fruits would have been featured, including cranberries, which traditionally accompanied game meat. However, there was no cranberry sauce as that sweetened, jellied delicacy was not yet invented. Thanksgiving has become a quintessential American holiday and, in many ways, a uniquely American experience. Of course, there are many things today associated with the fourth Thursday of November and the weekend following, which would not have been practiced in Plymouth Colony. Macy's and other parades, college football rivalries, such as Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and Georgia, Georgia Tech, among others, a mad consumeristic rush on Black Friday, and a buying spree leading up to Christmas, which the pilgrims definitely did not celebrate as they viewed it as a superstitious man-made religious holy day. On the other hand, we can point to items which contain at least a faint echo of the 1621 Thanksgiving, church services, perennial presidential proclamations which call upon the nation to remember the blessings it has received from God, and what might be called an ongoing American spirit of thanksgiving. And so the pilgrims helped to create an American observance. At the same time, one must remember that the contemporary Thanksgiving Day with a sense of coziness, middle-class respectability, and images of Norman Rockwell paintings differs greatly from the Pilgrims' view of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the Pilgrims was not so much a time for a family reunion. After experiencing the horrors of losing half of the colonists that first year, they were giving thanks to God for the family members who had simply survived. The Pilgrims were literally in a life and death struggle. And it was in that context that the pilgrims observed the occasion, not merely with feasting, but with an outpouring of prayers and psalms of thanksgiving. For many Christians, the pilgrims have served as models of inspiration. Congregationalists and Baptists agree with the pilgrims' view of the church, including Congregationalist church government and the notion of a voluntary and gathered church. Presbyterians and other Calvinists have sought to emulate the pilgrims' obvious piety, their simple worship, their psalm singing, their confidence in the gospel, and their Sabbath observance. Believers across a wide theological spectrum appreciate the quest for religious freedom and liberty of conscience, even as some have engaged in their own pilgrimage in fleeing religious persecution. The pilgrims have been featured in popular culture, for example, on postage stamps. Here we see examples of U.S. postage stamps from the Tercentenary Observance in 1920, the 350th anniversary in 1970, and the 400th anniversary in 2020. But it is not just U.S. stamps that have celebrated the pilgrims. Here are stamps from Great Britain, the Isle of Man, and Hungary. The arrival of the pilgrims has been commemorated on coins. Here is a U.S. silver half dollar minted in 1920. 
On one side, we see Governor William Bradford holding the Geneva Bible. On the other side, we see the Mayflower. Monuments and statues have also memorialized the pilgrims. In Plymouth, there is the 81-foot-tall Forefathers Monument, perhaps the world's largest solid granite monument, along with a statue of William Bradford. The coming of the pilgrims has inspired films. Some are more Hollywood fiction than historical fact. However, a fairly recent one by actor Kirk Cameron, Monumental, is a documentary about America's founding which builds on the foundation of the pilgrims. Numerous paintings have portrayed the pilgrims and their journey, including two very different depictions seen here of the landing of the pilgrims. And we can also think of poetry and literature. There is an abundance of literature, both primary and secondary. The pilgrims understood that what they were doing was significant, and therefore they documented their activities. In addition to William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation and Mort's Relation, there are church records and letters and diaries. There is much scholarship that has mined this rich field of study. And here is the National Geographic magazine for November 1957, which carried an account of the voyage of Mayflower II to the New World. One piece of literature that can be considered part of the Pilgrim's legacy was written by a lay preacher, John Bunyan. Bunyan was not formally one of the Pilgrims, but he was a nonconformist. For the crime of preaching without a license, he was imprisoned for more than a dozen years. During one of his times in jail in 1677, he composed a book that would become one of the world's most popular and all-time bestsellers the Pilgrim's Progress, an allegory about a man named Christian as he journeyed through life as one who was, in the words of the New Testament, a stranger and a pilgrim, just a passing through this world on his way to the celestial city, in other words, on his way to heaven. He went through the slough of despond and fought temptation in the wicked city called Vanity Fair before finally reaching his goal. At the beginning of this video, you heard the first stanza of a poem from The Pilgrim's Progress that has been put to music, a piece of music that sometimes is entitled He Who Would Valiant Be. In a few moments, you will hear the last two stanzas of that poem. For Americans, and indeed for the world as a whole, the story of the pilgrims is one of faith, adventure, boldness, courage, overcoming obstacles and friendship across ethnic lines. It is a legacy that still inspires today. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Atlanta Reformed Presbyterian Church and Heritage Presbyterian Church of Cumming, Georgia, pastored by Dr. Joe Moorcraft, a minister with a long interest in the pilgrims and one who served for a time on the board of the Plymouth Rock Foundation. As we have considered the pilgrims, these 17th century English emigrants, we've been reminded of the fact that they were a group of very dedicated believers. And this video has emphasized that corporate and communal dimension. The pilgrims constituted a movement, one which had profound effect on American history and indeed on world history. At the same time, we must not forget the intensely personal nature of the pilgrimage undertaken by these men and women. Perhaps the best way to remember that personal commitment is by means of a poem written by Governor William Bradford towards the end of his life. From my years young and days of youth, God did make known to me his truth and called me from my native place for to enjoy the means of grace. In wilderness he did me guide, and in strange lands for me provide, in fears and wants, through weal and woe, a pilgrim passed I to and fro.
Whoso beset him round with dismal stories, do but themselves confound his strength the more is. No lion can him fright, he'll with a giant fight, but he will have a right to be a pilgrim. A goblin nor foul fiend can daunt his spirit. He knows he at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies fly away, he'll not fear what men say. He'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim.